Thank you, Tom, and thank you for the invitation to uh, return to the uh, Henry Center project. It's great to, to be with all of you again. I look forward to our discussions. <clears throat> uh, in this paper, I explore the way the New Testament writers, no, not just Paul, New Testament writers, refer to Adam with a view to whether these references require a historical individual Adam in order to make sense of what they are saying. I argue that some of their arguments employing references to Adam lose coherence if Adam is not a historical individual. Before looking at the relevant texts, I need briefly to sketch my basic methodological stance in dealing with issues of this sort. I teach at Wheaton, a Christian liberal arts institution. I am required each year to endorse our doctrinal statement, which, among other things, states that the scriptures have, quote, supreme and final authority in all they say, close quote. I'm happy to sign such a statement, since a commitment to the authority and inerrancy of scripture has been integral to my faith since my conversion and is equally foundational to my work as an exegete of scripture. At the same time, the unofficial motto of Wheaton is, all truth is God's truth. This motto provides theological underpinning to the work of my colleagues in the sciences. What they discover in the world of nature is one of the ways in which God communicates truth to his people. Giving the appropriate weight to each of these assertions gets to the heart of the matter we are considering. I therefore begin with my own perspective on this crucial issue. When I was learning my theological method a long time ago now, uh, having the shock of sitting at my table with a gentleman who took beginning Greek with me in the 1970s, <laughs> back in those days, most scholars viewed the move from text to theology, uh, to theological and practical conclusions as a linear one. The interpreter of scripture analyzes texts, synthesizes those texts into a biblical theology, and then hands this neat package over to the systematic theologian, who, armed with philosophical insights and informed by history, provides dogmatic conclusions that instruct the contemporary church. This epistemologically foundational approach has, of course, been met head-on by postmodernism's reminder of the specific and inevitably subjective perspective that each of us brings to our work. Biblical exegesis such as myself, therefore, while resisting the nihilistic implications of pure postmodernism, nevertheless carry on our interpretive work in a chastened mood. While maintaining the possibility of attaining real objective truth in our study of scripture, we recognize and seek to take account of the various cultural, religious, and personal influences we inevitably bring to the process. A popular metaphor for the old linear approach was the bridge. Biblical theology as the summarizing of biblical teaching on a given topic serves as the bridge from the world of exegesis to the world of theology and application. We think the bridge metaphor helps us think about the way biblical theology works in our reading of scripture. But it also has limitations. Let's think about two kinds of bridges. The first is a one-way bridge, carrying traffic in only one way. The bridge metaphor is often used in just this way. Biblical theology carries traffic from the world of the text to our own world. This scenario, however, assumes a kind of linear approach that can't be sustained any longer. So we might modify our metaphor to picture our bridge as carrying traffic in two opposite directions, from text to world, and from our world back to the text. However, this scenario might imply that the two streams of traffic have little or no impact on one another, Therefore, a more helpful analogy from the world of transportation is the roundabout. In place of traffic moving in one direction only, or of traffic passing in opposite directions, we may think of traffic flowing from the text into a vortex, maybe not the right word, <laughs> 
but some of us uh, feel like we're in that vortex sometimes. I think we're doing our work. A vortex into which several other kinds of traffic flow. From this complex of intersecting roadways, ultimately emerges a main highway carrying the results of this merging of highways. Several kinds of roads feed into a roundabout. The road carrying the heaviest traffic must always, of course, be scripture itself. Not only the text we might be focused on, but also the framework for understanding the reality that scripture creates. Other roadways will include the theological frameworks constructed by historical and systematic theologians, our own personal and theological propensities, and the problems and concerns of our own cultural context. However, the roadway we need to consider here, especially for our issue, of course, is that which carries traffic from the scientific world. How are we to integrate these sources of truth? In the great majority of cases, the integration is rather smooth, either because scientists are studying matters about which the Bible is silent, or because scientists and theologians from their different approaches reach similar conclusions. But there are famously those points on which scripture and science appear to reach different conclusions. One thing at this point should be clear. It is not helpful to conceive of the issue as, quote, the Bible versus science. Rather, we should think of interpretations of the Bible versus interpretations of the natural world. On one side of the matter, then, science is not a monolithic and unchanging body of knowledge. Careful scientists often disagree, and new theories constantly challenge existing ones. Some Christians use this valid point to solve any potential conflict with Scripture, arguing that we are dealing with scientific theories which have their detractors and which may change overnight. I don't think this is an appropriate move. Of course, conclusions from the world of scientific inquiry have quite different levels of certainty. However, Christians too often have assessed that degree of certainty in light of potential conflicts with Scripture rather than recognizing that scientists themselves are the ones who need to judge this matter. Without ceding all final decisions to the experts in a given field, I recognize that those who have not been trained in a particular field of study usually lack the understanding of data and its interpretation required to make competent judgments. Thus, for example, I simply don't know enough to evaluate what appears to be an emerging consensus about the size of the original population that would be required to account for modern humans. On the other side of the matter, we must recognize that claims of what the Bible says are also potentially fraught. As a scholar in the field, I recognize that some matters in Scripture are pretty securely settled. God has given a Scripture that is perspicacious, that speaks clearly on matters that are central to the faith. However, there are many other matters in Scripture that are not so clear where good, sincerely motivated interpreters differ over what the Bible says. To return then to our roundabout illustration, at one extreme we find Christians who, in effect, want to erect a roadblock between the roadway of science and the interpretive roundabout. Science is so uncertain and subject to such rapid change that it should have no bearing on our biblical interpretation at all. Christians have historically believed that Adam was a historical individual, and we should simply ignore scientists who raise questions about this issue. At the other extreme, we find some who widen the roadway of science to the point that its traffic overwhelms the traffic emerging from study of the Bible. The current scientific con consensus, again, is that the current human population cannot have emerged from a single historical pair of individuals. Therefore, we must either, one, reinterpret Scripture accordingly, or two, limit Scripture's scope by arguing that the issue of a historical Adam is not a matter to which the Scripture speaks in an authoritative way. Finding the right stance between what I think are these unacceptable extremes is not easy. My own approach can be summarized in three points. One, I have to respect the number of experts, many of them faithful Christians, who think that the latest genetic evidence raises questions about the biological descent of all human beings from a single ancestor. Two, 
I have to allow that apparent truth from study of the natural world to feed into my interpretation of the biblical data. Three, I must, however, give priority to the meaning of the biblical text. My interpretation of that text will be affected by, but not determined by, the insights of my colleagues in the scientific disciplines. With some slight caveats, therefore, I endorse the perspective of William Brown in his book, The Seven Pillars of Creation. He refers to, and I quote now, a hermeneutical feedback loop between biblical faith and scientific understanding, whereby the former is enriched by the latter. If biblical creation faith is to be intelligible today, then it requires the feedback of science. This does not mean that science would dictate the directions of biblical interpretation and theological reflection. That would turn the dialogue into a hostile takeover. Rather, the process allows science to nudge the work of biblical theology in directions it has not yet ventured, and in so doing, add another layer to scripture's interpretive thickness. I turn now to uh, a survey of the way uh, Adam occurs in the New Testament scriptures. I'm, it's interesting, of course, that I have much more data to work with than my colleague here, Bill, Bill has. Um, uh, so I'm not going to go over this, but simply to uh, give you some of the data here in terms of the name of Adam, references to Adam, possible allusions to Adam, of course, in other ways. So for instance, you have the language of form and image of God, probably some allusion to Adam here, Paul's famous old man versus new man contrast, where old man almost certainly has some allusion to Adam as well so that we see Adam playing a fairly significant role in the New Testament scriptures. Uh, that role, however, uh, is not one in which there is any interest in the person of Adam, unlike some of the Jewish contemporaries of our New Testament authors, where there was a lot of speculation about what this original Adam was like. Uh, uh, I was about to use the word mythical and thought, no, I'd better just avoid that word in light of our current discussion. Uh, but a lot of uh, very interesting supernatural uh, attributes and so, and so forth. The New Testament, by contrast, focuses on three things, pretty much three things only. Um, his uh, relationship to Eve, where his significance as the first male is, is sort of the point. Uh, the issue of the unity of the human race, where his, uh, his role as first or founding human is significant, and his role, of course, in bringing sin and death into the world, where he is portrayed as first sinner. There's no reason to think, at least initially, that the New Testament writers disagree with their contemporaries about regarding Adam as a historical person. At least in, in my sense, as I understand the debate today, it is this. Do the arguments in which the New Testament refers to Adam require for those arguments to be valid that Adam was a single historical person? The critical texts are those in which a theological point appears to depend on reference to Adam. These fall into two general types. One, comparisons between Adam and Christ and Paul and appeal to Adam as the basis for the unity of humankind. So, beginning with Paul, and briefly in 1 Corinthians 15, we find Paul drawing a comparison in two different texts between Adam and Christ. These are dominated by two quite different as-so comparisons. To begin with the latter text, in 44b to 49, Adam and Christ are compared and contrasted. With respect to the nature of the bodies, they illustrate and initiate natural versus spiritual, a living being versus life-giving spirit, of the dust of the earth versus of heaven. The comparison is between Adam's body and the bodies of humans after him. Paul's purpose is both to explain the nature of the resurrection body and in contrast to some Jewish views to insist that the ultimate spiritual body is not part of the original creation but is tied to Christ's own resurrection body. Toward this end, Paul contrasts the first man Adam and the last Adam. Paul assumes here a historical Adam but does his argument depend on a historical Adam? 
I am unsure. Perhaps what we might call a narrative Adam might satisfactorily account for Paul's comparison. The second comparison comes earlier, verses 21 to 22, where the death Adam brought into the world is contrasted with the life, and particularly the resurrection life, that Christ initiated. A few interpreters have suggested that the reference in both verses might be simply to man, human, since, of course, Adam is a Hebrew word that means man or human. The point would simply be that as members of the human race, which has departed from its original vocation and God's intention, all men inherit death as their destiny. I'm quoting C.K. Barrett on 1 Corinthians here. However, Paul is writing in Greek to mainly Gentile believers. And there is no evidence that in the NT, Adam means anything but the particular male human character in Genesis 1 to 3. Anthropos in verse 21 must refer to a single human being, not to man or humans generically. Paul's comparison is between two individuals, Adam and Christ. And of course, this particular comparison is elaborated in much greater detail in Romans 5, 12 through 21. I've got my eye on the clock, but it looks like I have an hour and 40 minutes left. So, um, uh, according to that clock at least. So I think, I th I think we're fine. <laughs> Romans 5, 12 to 21 is the most extensive and important theological appropriation of the Adam story in the letters of Paul. As literature on the topic attests, this is the linchpin New Testament passage in the debate about a historical Adam. We'll therefore devote considerable time to it, starting with a general exposition of the text and then moving on to conclusions about the role Paul here assigns to Adam, ending with observations on how that role impacts our view of historical Adam. In Romans 5, 1 through 11, uh, Paul opens the second major stage of his argument in the letter by celebrating the assurance that believers enjoy. Simply put, verse 2, we boast in the hope of the glory of God because we are in Christ and not in Adam. At least that's how I put the whole chapter, Romans 5, together. The logical thrust of Paul's teaching in the chapter then is to highlight the determinative nature of Christ's work on our behalf. Contributors to the recent historical Adam debate are therefore justified in claiming that Romans 5, 12 to 21 is basically about Christ and not about Adam. However, this pertinent observation in no way minimizes the importance of Paul's appeal to Adam. If not his focus... Paul does teach important things about Adam, sin, and death, and these cannot simply be swept aside. Verse 12 has received a lot of attention in debates about original sin and the role of Adam. The internal structure of the verse is a bit unclear, but most scholars, in my view, rightly conclude that Paul starts a comparison in this verse that he does not, grammatically at least, finish. English translations mark this break in syntax by inserting a dash after verse 12. The first clause attributes the entrance of sin into the world to one man. This man is, of course, Adam, whose very name in Hebrew means man or human. Reference to sin in the singular is characteristic, particularly of Romans 5 through 8, where in this part of the letter, at least, Paul personifies sin giving it an active role. Through this personification, Paul shows that individual acts of sin constitute a principle or network of sin that is so pervasive and dominant, and dominant that a person's destiny is determined by those actions. In the present case, then, the sin that enters the world is more than an individual sin. It is the bridgehead that paves the way for sinning as a condition of humanity. The fact that Paul attributes the sin to Adam is significant since he certainly knows from Genesis that the woman Eve sinned first. Already we see that Adam is being given a status in salvation history that is not tied simply to temporal priority. 
Paul's claim that sin came into the world through one man would have been nothing new to anyone who knew their OT or Jewish tradition. Nor would his second assertion in this verse. And through sin, death came into the world. The unbreakable link between sin and death made clear in Genesis 23 was a staple of Jewish theology. But what does Paul mean by death here? He may refer to physical death, mainly, since death in verse 14 seems to have this meaning. But the passage goes on to contrast death with eternal life, verse 21. Moreover, in verses 16 and 18, Paul uses condemnation in place of the language of death. These points suggest that, these points suggest that Paul may here refer to spiritual death, the estrangement from God that is a result of sin and that if not healed through Christ will lead to eternal death. In fact, however, we are not forced necessarily to make a choice between these options. Paul frequently uses death and related words to designate a physical, spiritual entity. Total death, the penalty that is incurred for sin. But the focus here seems to me, in light of verse 18 to 19, is on spiritual death. Probably then, Paul refers to physical death only as it is bound up with sin. As Anthony Thistleton paraphrases, death is related to sin. Therefore, we don't think that this passage or any passage in Paul eliminates the possibility, in our view, probability, that physical death existed in the world long before Adam. As verse 12b depicts the entrance of death as a consequence of sin, verse 12c makes explicit that this death has spread to every person. The exact relationship of this clause to its context depends on what the adverb in this way, Greek hutos, means. While this is debated, the majority of uh, people writing on Romans, I think rightly so, conclude that in this way draws a comparison between the manner in which death came into the world through sin and the manner in which death spread to everyone also through sin. Verse 12 then is a neatly balanced chiasm, which we see the one man sinning and bringing death into the world, and with respect to all people then, that death being spread because of sinning. If this reading of the structure of the verse is right, then verse 12d has the purpose of showing that death is universal because sin is universal. All sin. Paul asserts that the entrance of death into the world through the sin of Adam has led to death for all people, and all people die because all people sin. In a sense, then, Paul's concern in this verse and throughout the passage is not so much with original sin, or better, originating sin, but with original death. Paul says nothing explicitly about how the sin of one man, Adam, has resulted in death for everyone, nor has he made clear the connection, if any, between Adam's sin, verse 12a, and the sin of all people, verse 12d. What he has made clear is that the causal nexus between sin and death exhibited in the case of Adam has repeated itself in the case of every human being. No one, Paul makes clear, escapes the reign of death because no one escapes the power of sin. Each of us dies because each of us sins. Now, aware that he has broken off his comparison, Paul returns to it and completes it, as we will see in verses 18 and 19. Before doing that, however, Paul takes a brief detour, and there are two points in the detour that I think are relevant to our discussion here, both in verse 14. The language from the time of Adam to the time of Moses uh, reinforces the point that we have made earlier, that for Paul, Adam was apparently, like Moses, a historical personage. Perhaps even more significant is Paul's claim at the end of verse 14 that Adam is a pattern of the one to come. Pattern translates the Greek tupos, the word from which we derive typology. Biblical types operate as Scholars generally agree at the level of history as key persons, events, or institutions in the OT 
are seen as prefiguring something like them in the New Testament economy. Once more then, it, it seems probable at least that Paul is thinking of Adam as a historical individual. Here we might even go a step further and ask whether this claim about the tupas, which undergirds the argument of verses 12 to 21, can be considered valid if Adam is not, in fact, a historical individual. The structural similarity between Adam's relationship to his descendants and Christ's to his underlines all of verses 15 to 21. But in the second stage of, uh, of a detour from the main argument, Paul, in verses 15 to 17, notes that this parallelism and structural relationship does not extend to the nature of their two acts and their consequences. But I want to turn now to verses 18 and 19, where Paul completes the comparison that was only halfway presented in verse 12. In these two verses, Paul summarizes the basic argument in the paragraph, finally stating the full comparison between Adam and Christ. He began verse 12. Paul returns to the simple comparative structure, as so also. And this comparative structure is the basic building block of verses 18 to 21. Our concern, of course, is with the way Paul presents Adam's side in the comparison. Repeating the point he made earlier in verse 12, though using a different word, Paul attributes to Adam a trespass, parptoma, that has brought condemnation to all humans. And just in case we've missed this critical point, Paul reiterates it in verse 19, using the same basic structure in verse 18, but with slightly different language. Paul's final summary statement in verse 21 follows the pattern of comparison that provides the basic framework for Paul's teaching in the paragraph. But instead of comparing Adam and Christ, it compares the results of their respective actions. Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let me move from exposition to theological evaluation of what's going on in this paragraph. Uh, there is no doubt that the most important explicit role for Adam in New Testament teaching is his role in inaugurating the reign of sin and death. A lot hinges, obviously, on just how we define this role. Such a move from text to theological synthesis is inevitably subjective, and it is therefore no surprise that exegetes and theologians come to very different conclusions. The nub of the issue can be simply stated. How do we integrate two of Paul's apparently contradictory claims? One, Every human being dies because every human being sins, verse 12. Two, every human being dies because Adam sinned, verse 18. Three possibilities. First, we could be content to posit an unresolved tension between the individual and the corporate emphasis. Paul does not clearly, explicitly resolve these two perspectives, two perspectives, and we should not force a resolution that Paul himself never made. Now, the exegete in me applauds the concern to let each text have its own say. The theologian in me is reluctant to give up too early the pursuit of an interpretation that integrates Paul's teaching. Second, then, we might privilege the apparently individual focus of verse 12 and interpret verses 18 to 19 in light of it. There are a lot of ways to do this, but in my view, the most likely way is to assume a middle term in the connection between Adam's sin and the condemnation of all humans. Each person dies because each person sins, but each person necessarily sins because of a sin nature inherited from Adam. Death then is due immediately to the sinning of each individual, but ultimately to the sin of Adam. For it was Adam's sin that corrupted human nature and that made individual sinning an inevitability. This view has much in its favor. It retains the normal meaning of sin in verse 12, while explaining at the same time how Paul could assert that Adam's sin brings condemnation upon all. 
It also explains why all people act contrary to the will of God. There is a fatal, God-resisting bent in all humans inherited from Adam. The obvious drawback to this view is its need to add a step in Paul's argument that is not explicit in the context. Moreover, assuming this intermediate step appears to stand in some tension with Paul's persistent focus on the significance of the one act of the one man, Adam. Many died through one man's trespass, verse 15. The judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, verse 16. Because of the trespass of one man, death reigned, verse 17. One man's trespass led to the condemnation of all, verse 18. On the view we are examining, these statements must be expanded to mean, one man's trespass resulted in the corruption of human nature which caused all people to sin and so brought condemnation on all. Third, then, we might reverse the procedure of view 2 and interpret verse 12 in light of verses 18 to 19. Paul can view the sin of all people, verse 12, and the sin of Adam, verses 18 and 19, as a single complex in light of Adam's significance as a corporate figure. Drawing from the well-known biblical concept of corporate solidarity, we would then see Adam as the representative head of the human race whose sin is at the same time the sin of all humans. In Adam all die, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, because in Adam all sinned. Now, this view also requires us to read something into the text. In this case, the notion of Adam as a corporate representative figure. However, at least in my view, what is read into the text here is arguably a conception that Paul makes quite determinative in his way of picturing the work of Christ, the second Adam. Where do these theological syntheses leave us with respect to a historical Adam? As some scholars have noted, the second view we have considered appears to be able to do without a historical Adam better than the third view. If Paul cites the story of Adam as he finds it in Scripture in order simply to explain the universal sway of the sin nature, we could substitute mankind for Adam without losing his argument entirely. New Testament scholar Hans Konzelman puts it like this, quote, We are not in Adam substantially, but insofar as we take over his act in our own. The mythical idea of representation is thus limited to the truth that I can no longer break out of sin through decision and action. I always already have the fall behind me. Close quote. A wide-ranging theological surface is here, however. Just what is the fall that is behind me? More particularly, how can a myth, sorry, Bill, about the origin of sin account for the historical reality of sin and death. Those who dismiss a historical fall in Adam must provide some alternative account that has historical purchase. Only if we posit some kind of fall in history will we be able to avoid attributing sin and death to the original constitution of humans, impugning the goodness of God's creation. If jettisoning a historical Adam renders the transmission of sinful nature more difficult to comprehend, doing without a historical Adam would appear to be even more difficult if we are thinking of an original or originating sin that has led to universal human condemnation. Such a representative act presupposes a divine appointment similar to the appointment of Christ, our second Adam. We gain very Little here by positing the existence of a collective group of humans chosen at some point in history by God to be our representatives. And we lose Paul's forceful portrayal of one man, Adam, who stands in comparison with the one man, Christ. Before concluding on this point, however, I need to uh, put this issue into the roundabout we talked about earlier. Some interpreters have suggested that the traffic from the road of early Judaism might play a significant role in our estimate of these options. I disagree, but I don't have the time to develop that point here. 
More significant is the traffic from the road of current science. If that science, with all the caveats we noted earlier, suggests the idea of a single atom figure is difficult to sustain, should this not weigh in favor of the second option against the third? Yes, I think so. But how heavily should we weigh this factor? Well, in this case, I, I remain relatively certain about what I think the text is doing. And in my view, at least, the considerations from the latest scientific findings are not enough to shift my view of the text. A final point. Uh, some participants in this discussion in recent years argue that Paul's comparison between Christ and Adam would work perfectly well if Adam were a literary, but not a historical figure. Thus, for instance, the preacher who compares what Christ did on the cross and what Aslan did on the stone table would never be thought to be making Aslan a figure in history. But this analogy misses the key point Paul is making. Christ is like Adam, his antitype, in that both are representative figures who act decisively to determine the fate of all who belong to them. But they are unlike in that Christ rescues humans from the lamentable condition that Adam inaugurated. The effects of Adam's act in history, universal sinfulness and death, would seem to demand an Adam who sinned in history. Thus, if I were to argue that Christ has saved us from the condition that the evil white witch of Narnia has created, my listeners would be confused and probably unpersuaded of the point I'm trying to make. I would be positing events in our history caused by, respectively, a fictional character and a real character. Adam, as Paul makes clear, functions on the same historical plane as Moses, the law, and Christ, of whom he is the type. To summarize this point, Paul's argument for Christian assurance, based on his comparison between the representative apocal acts of Adam and Christ, assumes for its cogency a historical Adam. Yes, True, Paul's point is finally about assurance, and this point stands even if his particular argument based on Adam fails to have cogency. However, we do lose important theological points he wants to make about the entrance of sin and death into the world, and of course, potentially we lose confidence in the reliability of scripture. The second New Testament theological argument that bears on the historicity of Adam is the way universal human conclusions appear to be rooted in our common ancestry from two original humans, Adam and Eve. While, of course, biological, has, biological descent has played an important role in the history of discussion of Adam and his significance in Romans 5, in my view, the text says nothing about this issue. But other texts potentially do. For instance, in both 1 Corinthians 11, 8 to 9 and 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, Paul suggests that the relationship between Christian men and women is informed by the way God created the first man and the first woman. Now, Paul could, of course, simply be citing Genesis 1 to 3 as an illustration of his point. But it is also possible that he implies that men and women are to relate to one another in a certain way because of their descent from these two original humans. Paul may suggest something of the same sort when he cites the first man, Adam, as the template for the composition of human beings in their natural state. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 15. The same kind of Logic, universal human relatedness because of common descent from one man may be present in two other texts, Luke 3.38 and Acts 17.26. Now the gospel verse records the last names in Jesus' genealogy. In contrast to Matthew, who traces Jesus' descent from Abraham to Jesus, Luke begins with Jesus and ends with the son of Adam, the son of God. He thereby highlights an important theme in his gospel, Jesus' universal significance. Jesus is not just the Messiah of Israel, descended from Abraham, as in Matthew, but the Savior of all humans, Gentiles and Jews alike. Of course, since Paul is talking here only about Jesus' descent, we have to be cautious about drawing wider inferences. 
But it is possible that Luke identifies Jesus in this way in order to associate him with all humans via common ancestry from Adam. Caution is needed here, however, because Luke is not explicit about this. And further, as we all know, names and genealogies sometimes have representative rather than biological significance. The second text we should consider along these lines is Acts 17, 26. This comes in Paul's address to the Greeks in the Areopagus in Athens. To stress the unity of all humans, Paul claims that he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their periods and the boundaries of their habitation, RSV. The key phrase rendered straightforwardly in the RSV is from one, which is in the Greek, simply, henos. The text you have on the slide has made an interpretation of what that one probably refers to. Now, the most likely reference, as most interpreters agree here, is a reference to Adam. If so, Paul would appear to be tracing the human ancestry of every human being to Adam. Now, to be sure, there are other options. For instance, my colleague, John Walton, has suggested that Paul may have in mind Noah. Walton cites texts such as Genesis 9.19, and I quote, These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Close quote. Others suggest that Paul here might mean something simply like from one stock, since the word one is not elaborated. However, it has to be said that Noah is never mentioned elsewhere by Paul, who is, of course, the speaker in Acts 17, while, of course, he frequently cites Adam as a first human. These two last texts raise especially clearly the thorny issue of monogenism, that is, the idea that all humans descend from a single ancestor. Monogenism is widely questioned today by scientists who are convinced that genetic evidence simply does not allow for such a possibility. Of course, to return to a point we made earlier, there are, as usual, some scientists who dissent from this claim. I myself am unsure whether the New Testament teaches or necessarily assumes monogenism. Some of the texts we've considered may suggest it, but I am not sure they are determinative especially when we allow traffic from current science to have its limited but necessary impact on our interpretation. I have some concluding things I could say, but I think I would prefer to save time for questions, if that's appropriate, Dr. McCall. Okay.